Tell us about Natasha. Um, what sort of girl was she? Natasha was a really good girl. <laughs> um, as a child, she was never any trouble at all. She was just funny. She was full of laughter, um, full of love. She was cheeky. She was a bit of a tomboy, but she had her girly moments as well. She was a, a, just a, a lovely, lovely she child. She had a, an inbuilt sense of what was right as well. The law interested her, didn't it? It did. As she got older, she was, she was for the... Underdog. She liked to she, things that she saw on the news or in the press would make her really angry if she felt yeah. it was unfair. And she had work experience. Literally, I think it was a month before she passed away, and it was at a human rights law firm. Wow. That's what she was interested in, and politics, and just just something. She wanted to do something good with her life. Well, she, um, it was when she was pretty young that she developed these severe allergies to, to quite a range of foods, actually. It was milk, yeah. eggs, avocados, sesame seeds. Um, quite a frightening thing, I think, as a parent and also for her when your child has severe allergies and sort of learning to go through life to, to avoid these things. Mm. She had an inbuilt radar, though. There was, uh, we, she obviously knew from us that there were certain things that she couldn't eat. But even as a really young child, if somebody offered her a sweet that I hadn't seen, she wouldn't take it. She yeah. knew not to, and she would find one of us to say, can I have that? So she was very aware. <clears throat> right from the start, wasn't very she? Very aware, mm. in fact, exceptionally so. I think anyone who lives with, as a family with uh, anyone who has allergies in the family uh, scrupulously aware, uh, almost to the level of forensic, I would mm. say. And she, as a as a young teenager, was very aware. Read labels and trusted labels always, and we mm. taught her to, to do so. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it seemed the right thing to do, and she did that. So at the beginning of that uh, that holiday, as we said in the introduction, there, this is the start of the best summer ever. Positive, yes. fun, yes. you know, life ahead of you, oh, yes. long summer days. Mm -hmm. So you're at the airport, um, and uh, and what did she say? Did she say, "I'm just going to go and pop off and get something to to, to eat"? Yes, yeah, the first flight out of the morning. Uh, uh, so we didn't have breakfast at home because much too early when we left home. We were at Terminal Five, and uh, we just popped into Pret a Manger as a group, three of us, quite busy uh, at that time. And, I, and she went to choose a sandwich, something to eat. Choose something to eat, basically, that she knew she was safe with. Um, and she's with her friend, Bethany. And she came back to me, and I was just, just a few feet away. I said, Daddy, I, look, I found this sandwich. It had olives in it and uh, artichokes, one of two of her most favorite foods she'd eat every week at home. But this is fine for me. And um, uh, Bethany saw it as well. I looked at it, looked it over, said, yep, that's fine for you, absolutely. Uh, and we bought that sandwich. So the, the issue here is, and this is what the inquest was investigating, was that there is a loophole in the law. There was no labelling on there that said that it would contain anything that somebody might be allergic to. So she, she wasn't to know, and, and that's, that's the problem. Exactly. Yeah, so mm. th absolutely, there was nothing, no mention of allergens whatsoever, and nothing, on the counter, vis on the... nothing visible at all to the eye. Uh, and if I said before, I'm somebody who's quite visual and I would spot things like that, and certainly Natasha, whose life depended yeah. on it, would see something like that. And things escalated quickly for her on the flight. She started to get itchy uh, around the throat, and I think she took some antihistamine yes. to hope that that would make things better. Yeah. And then gradually throughout the journey, things progressed pretty quickly, and you administered the EpiPen for her. I administered, yes. It's for people, again, who are allergic, severely allergic, they do travel and take responsibility to having EpiPens, two, in case one fails. Actually. I have one in my bag downstairs. I'm allergic to bee and wasp stings. Right. I have okay. an EpiPen in okay. my bag. Then, then you'll know. And mm. indeed, many people will know of that, mm. that, that EpiPens are considered the life-saving device in such a situation. I administered uh, an EpiPen to her right thigh, which is the, the way to do it, into the large muscle of the body. Yeah. And believed, we believed, I think that would be it, that would work, because it's the backstop, your last resort. She said, Daddy, it's not working. Help me, I can't breathe, get the other one. I ran back to the seat very quickly. I grabbed the second one from a handbag, ran back and injected it into her thigh within seconds, held and counted the required amount of time, and she didn't get better just shockingly didn't get better. In fact, everything rapidly went, within minutes, deteriorated to a point and... How her... far were you from landing? Well, the flight was, at this point, just more than halfway through. We're about uh, 35, 40 minutes before landing, somewhere around that time. Um, so still a few hundred miles from the final, final destination. 
um, it was incredible how the situation unfolded. It was like a, it felt like a, a war zone. Yeah. What happened next was shocking. Um, you landed um, at Nice Airport and she was taken to hospital. Yes. And sadly, we know the horrible ending to this is yeah. that she lost her life. Yeah. Um, you are at home. You have no idea what's unfolding in the skies, what's no. happening. This none, none at all. I dropped them off at the airport, said goodbye, hugged them all and went back home. And I got a call at half past nine, just as the plane was preparing to land. Um, and I'd called me and said, um, Tashi's really ill, you've got to come out here straight away. Um, I managed to find a flight. It was the first day of the the first Sunday of the summer holidays, so everything was booked, and I managed to find a flight from Stansted. And um, I got there. It was a six o'clock flight, and then I was told, I'm sorry, but the flight's full. There's no room for you, at which point I burst into tears, and the lady managed to get me on that aeroplane. But it was delayed for another six hours, so I sat in the gate knowing that... Um, and not knowing, knowing and not knowing, knowing how bad it was, but not knowing how terribly bad it was. There's, there's, you know, as a parent, you, you just pray and you hope she'll pull through. She was strong. She, she had everything to live for. I, in my heart, she can get through this. She can get through this. And then I got a call from Nad about seven o'clock saying, you've got to say goodbye to her. You say goodbye to her now. I'm going to put the phone by her ear, but you've got to do it quickly. And how do you do that? I don't know. You just do. Then you don't, you do and you don't, I don't know how you do it, but he gave me the opportunity to say goodbye. I said goodbye to her and, um, and I just collapsed. He took the, he said, I've got to go now. And, and that was it. And I just, I just fell down. I can't imagine the catastrophic blow that has on your family. You've got a son, you've got Alex as well. Um, and you're saying that, and I know that you, Nadine, you, oh, you, Nadine. you um, were diagnosed with PTSD and uh, both of you finding it incredibly hard to function. Um, you said something, and I read something that broke my heart. I mean, the entire thing breaks my heart. But you said, how could it be that I failed her? But you didn't, you didn't <laughs> fail her. She was failed by loopholes in the system, shortcuts in, yes. in the system. You also said she didn't die on your watch, she died on Pret's watch. That's right, that's right. I mean, that's just, I think as any parent would know um, that you feel, oh, you can't imagine your child's gonna die in front of you. We don't, we don't bury our children, it's not the way it should work. And um, she died, well, it was with me uh, and not you. And I think the sense of terrible guilt that was racking me with, I was the one that was there with her. It wasn't mummy, if you like. And not that I wished it was the other way around, but it's just a terrible pang. How could it be so? I'm her protector, I'm her daddy. If a parent is anything, he is the, a parent is an ultimate carer for their child and would die a thousand times before. You could. With her, um, as you said, when her interest and her passion for for justice, you are trying to find a way of yes. making a change and doing something good. Um, and Natasha's Law is something that you are now able to focus on. Mm -hmm. And this is the right at the start of this, and you're trying to change the law for her and for others like her. What are you hoping to change? Well, in the year following Natasha's death, I was really aware in the press of other people dying from allergies. And it, there were young people coming down to London for a day um, in, you know, all over the country. There, there are about five allergies, literally, in one summer of deaths. And we, it was just shocking that this is just part of our life, our, part of what we hear and, and what nothing seems to be, nothing seems to be done about it. And it's really time for society just to take it more seriously. Allergens, there are 14 of them, and they are poisonous to allergic people. They need to be on packaging. If something's pre-packaged, those allergens have to be mm. on that packaging yep. to save lives. And if we can be given a voice to make that happen through what happened to our daughter, we have to do that.